to the kill count, where we tally up the victims in all our favorite horror movies. I'm Crazy James, and today we're looking at Friday the 13th Part 2, released in 1981, a mere 10 months after its predecessor. As we learned in its kill count, no one expected the original Friday to be such a smash hit. But thanks to Tom Savini's gore, Harry Manfredini's score, and the last 15 minutes, with an unhinged Betsy Palmer and the Swamp Boy Jason jump scare, people went kiki-ki mama motherfucking nuts for the movie, and distributor Paramount asked for a sequel to be made post-haste. The decision to focus on Jason Voorhees was suggested by Phil Scuderi, one of Friday the 13th's Boston backers alongside Steve Manazian and Bob Barsamian. Look at these fucking guys, they're such guys! But bringing Jason back to avenge his dead mom created a sort of paradox for the plot. After all, Jason drowned as a kid, which is why his mom started killing people in the first place. If you try to track that on any kind of a timeline, it makes no sense whatsoever. This nonsense turned off Tom Savini, the man who designed Little Swamp Boy Jason. And I got the script, and Jason is running around. I thought, what are you doing? There is no Jason. No, the mother's the killer. Jason was a kid that drowned in the lake. Oh, we're gonna change all that. Savini went to work on The Burning instead, and producer-director Sean S. Cunningham, who came up with Friday the 13th in the first place, also passed on the project so he could do something different. <laughs> Why didn't you make a sequel? Directing duties fell to Cunningham's friend Steve Miner, a producer and one of the men most responsible for the original. Eager to prove himself in his directorial debut, the 29-year-old Miner rehired a lot of the first film's crew, and aimed to make a sequel that was faithful but faster and scarier. To that end, he succeeded. Though Friday 2 has plenty of downtime, it moves faster and looks better than the much more amateur Part 1. The first film's box office success afforded the sequel a bigger budget, which Miner used in part on a steady cam that kept the camera in constant motion. For eight weeks in the fall of 1980, Miner and his cast and crew filmed at Kenwood Camp in Kent, Connecticut. With Victor Miller also against having Jason as a character, Part 2's screenplay would be written by Ron Kurt who did uncredited additions to the first film script. He wrote the so-called humorous scene with a motorcycle cop, and at least he claims the Swamp Boy Jason ending. Everybody, including the special effects man, the girl who went out for lunch, claimed to have written this scene. <laughs> but I wrote it. I think that scene much more likely came from Miller and Cunningham, but in any case, Kurt simply took the structure of the first film and repeated it. Part 2 is almost a remake as much as it is a sequel. Once again, attractive soon-to-be camp counselors get stalked by a mostly unseen killer. But thankfully, Part 2's characters feel more fleshed out and sympathetic than their Part 1 counterparts. And while Alice Hardy was a fantastic final girl, Ginny Field, as played by Amy Steele, is my favorite of the franchise. Even without Savini, Part 2's kills are pretty great, but because of the first film's success and reputation, the MPAA went hard on this movie, resulting in nearly a minute of gore being cut. The original footage was only recently found, and included on the Scream Factory box set of Blu-rays. Since it's graphic stuff though, I can only show it in the explicit versions of these videos on Patreon. I'm sorry, but YouTube kinda feels like the MPAA in this case, particularly stingy about gore when it comes to Friday the 13th. No matter how graphic the kills are or aren't, it's my job to count them up, so let's go! The movie begins two months after the first film ended, with a kid splashing through a rainy street way too recklessly. Stupid kid, gotta look out for sewer clowns, brah. <laughs> And Jason! Cause with the return of Harry Manfredini's string section, adult Jason takes his first steps towards avenging his murdered mother. He's approaching the house of Alice Hardy, our final girl from the first film, who's now wriggling around on her bed in a very green, very warm getup. Overalls and a turtleneck? Girl, you about to be having the night sweats for show! Even though this movie came out less than a year after its predecessor, it spends a full five minutes recapping the end of the original, Jason chair jumper and all. Alice finally wakes up after a while, then walks around in a nothing scene while the camera follows her on a steady cam. There was no script written for this cold open, so when Adrian King showed up to set, she was told to improvise. She had to just make up everything she says here. I just have to put my life back together, and this is the only way I know how. After five more languishing minutes, Alice opens up her fridge for a midnight snack of rotten head, which is when she's grabbed from behind and killed by an ice pick going through her temple. Go on and get, little kitty. The final girl's finally dead. Adrian King agreed to return 
for a sequel, but was never told her part in it would be so small. I didn't know it was over for Alice until I got there, so it's a surprise. With no script, she arrived on what she described as a hostile set, and that was before she got hurt by a faulty ice pick prop that didn't properly retract as it was pushed into her temple. Complicating matters was the fact that King was dealing with a stalker who started following her after the first film's success. Stalking was not taken seriously back in 1980. The stalker wove himself into her life and things got real fucking serious. Eventually, uh, I had a gun to my head and uh, I was able to talk the fan down. The experience obviously impacted her, but she credits healthy, loving fans that she's met at countless conventions for helping her heal and recover emotionally. Our same style title card fucking explodes, giving us a big ol' part two, and queuing up an awesome kick-ass credit sequence. <laughs> Nope, never mind. Same as the first one. We come out of the credits five years later, and since there's only an hour 15 left of this thing by now, we've gotta get moving fast. Good thing the characters drive an extra big ass truck. Not Kevin Bacon Jeff and his underage girlfriend Sandra are passing through town on their way to be camp counselors. And we all know how crazy Ralph feels about camp counselors. You're all doomed. You're all doomed. In this one, the counselors aren't at Camp Crystal Lake. They're at another camp on Crystal Lake, training at a place called the Pakanak Lodge. As you'll see throughout the series, Crystal Lake has a ton of summer camps and houses on its shore. The other counselors at the Pakanak Lodge include such mainstays as the hot chick and the perv who's always hitting on the hot chick. There's also a couple who are genuinely sweet, a bunch of background randos who don't really matter, and this goofy stork of a guy named Ted, who has a hard time finding good length shorts for those stilts of his. Their boss, played by John Fury is Paul Holt. Paul Holt and his assistant slash romantic interest is our final girl, Ginny Field. I love how frank and forward she is. Uh, Ginny, I'm starting to worry about you. Bullshit, Paul. She can also handle a chainsaw and kick ass in chess, and she even gets a dab of backstory that comes in handy later. Use a little of that child psychology you're majoring in. Jimmy's the best. By part two, Friday's already building its own legend. I don't want to scare anyone, but I'm gonna give it to you straight about Jason. Good. Straight talk only here, Paul. He gives a dramatic recital of Jason's backstory, conveying director Steve Miner's idea that Jason somehow survived his drowning. The campfire tale ends with a scare when Ted jumps out in a mask and fur undies. Haha, <laughs> got him, Ted. Ted, you linguini looking motherfucker. Ted's played by Stu Charno, who was previously seen on the Kill Count in Christine, and whose nephew is Dan Sugarman, the guitarist for Ice Nine Kills. That band's straight up collecting people associated with horror, huh? That night, while the other counselors are arm wrestling or doggy dancing, Ginny is spied upon while sucking face with Paul Holt. Turns out it's Crazy Ralph giving their spit swap in the old stink eye, and he pays for his peeping tomery when he's killed with a garrote around his neck. Damn, just like that, we're out of characters from the original. Part 2 is thankfully not as glacial as the first film, since there are more endearing character moments that are awkward and or funny. Come and get him! Here. The increased comedy also comes from the film's visual language, like when Terry's dog Muffin comes across Jason in the woods and it smash cuts the hot dogs on the grill. Later, Muffin's fate is pretty much confirmed when Jeff and Sandra sneak off to trespass onto Camp Crystal Lake property. They find a mangled dog and are then found by Deputy Winslow, whose name is not in the movie but comes from the movie's novelization. Winslow's a local who's upset that Paul Holt's trying to start another summer camp here. Things have been quiet for five years and that's the way we want to keep it. On his way out, he sees a figure run across the road, so he follows him, flouncing through the forest like a nimble wood elf. Wait, hold the deputy prancer, fix the hair. Great, back to it. Winslow runs for a good long while after a pair of legs speed walking away in blue jeans. He comes across a makeshift shack that must have been built by Jason, you know, during the 20 years after he was thought to have drowned, but actually survived and, uh, I, I don't know, lived around the lake somehow? The ex-dead subpar swimmer sneaks up on Deputy Winslow and kills him with a hammer claw to the back of the head. Someone needs to make me a nutcracker that looks like this guy's face. Look at those teeth, man. They could crack open a walnut. That night, Paul Holt makes plans to lower our body count drastically. He's taken all the rando counselors into town, leaving slim pickings behind for the J-man to kill. Among his murder options is Terry, the hot girl who's been looking for her hot dog, and her persistent pursuer Scott, who's fond of slingshotting stones into her butt. Scott's played by Russell Todd, last seen on the kill count in Chopping Mall. He drove a little cart into a killer robot after it murdered his 
wife. Damn, that movie's great. Jeff and Sandra are forced to stay behind because of their brush with Johnny Law, while athletic wheelchair user Mark chooses not to go to the bar because of self-esteem issues. Nothing spoils a party faster than a drunk in a wheelchair. That's crap. His adorable admirer Vicky says she'll stay behind to keep him company. These two are one of my favorite couples of the franchise, especially after Vicky's string of flirtatious innuendo. I only want your fingers. What do you want to play for? Position. Vicky's actor Lauren Marie Taylor said she quickly developed a crush on Mark's actor Tom McBride, but was gently turned down by him when he told her he was gay. Sadly, McBride died in 1995 due to AIDS-related complications at the age of 42. Rest in peace. With the counselors whittled down to a good killing quantity, Terry goes off by herself to go skinny dipping in the lake. I swear, these idiot kids make it too easy for Jason sometimes. Also, I think these horned up screenwriters drastically overestimate how often young women and go skinny dipping by themselves. I needed the TNA for me. Uh, to hell with the audience. Terry emerges from the undoubtedly freezing cold water to find that fuckface Scott has taken her clothes. Serves him right when he steps into a snare that hangs him upside down from a tree. As Terry goes back to camp for a knife to cut him down with, Scott is killed by a throat slit with the dull side of a machete. They'll do that a lot throughout this series. Terry comes back and finds Scott dead, then turns around and dies screaming into the camera guy's face. Back at the cabins, Vicky and Mark have finished playing and are ready to get to work, if you know what I mean. She steps away to change and spray some perfume in her panties. That's gotta sting! After she's gone for a bit too long, Mark comes out onto the porch to look for her. <laughs> oh, and he gets a machete to the face! The poor guy rolls back and takes a backward spill down multiple flights of steps that seem to go on forever. The kill ends with a wild freeze frame and a zoom in. Mark's kill was shot from behind to hide the styrofoam mask Tom McBride was wearing, which they swung a balsa wood machete straight into. Part 2's makeup effects were done by Carl Fullerton, who was recommended by Dick Smith after Savini declined to return. At first, Stan Winston was going to do makeup. He made the Mrs. Voorhees head Alice found in her fridge. But a last-minute scheduling conflict took Winston away, giving Carl Fullerton a mere six weeks to design and create makeup effects that Steve Miner wanted good enough to shoot in close-ups. He did a great job, and it's a shame the MPAA forced so much of it to be cut. Back inside, Jeff plays a harmonica in bed. His music brings all the girls to the stage, and they're like, I'm not legal age. Yep, Sandra's actor Marta Cover, who we saw nine years later as a pizza lady in Slumber Party Massacre 3, was only 17 when she filmed Friday the 13th Part 2. Apparently, this sex scene originally had nudity, but when Paramount found out, they obviously ordered the footage removed. Really should have never gotten to that point. Vicky's actor, Lauren Marie Taylor, was also 17 when production began, and says in retrospect, her mom probably should have signed something for the scene of her changing. Jeff and Sandra's nudity wasn't the only thing cut from the scene. When Jason comes in to kill them, the twofer he gets with the spear is good, but it was heavily censored by the MPAA and had its most graphic shots removed. You can tell how much gnarlier it was going to be in production stills. This kill was shot in a similar way to Kevin Bacon's, with the actors standing in a whole beneath the bed so the spear could go through a back made of latex. Jeff's actor Bill Randolph said it was highly uncomfortable until a sound guy offered some help. He said, open your mouth and blow some powder into my mouth. And I'm telling you, they could have filmed it 15 times. I was having a great time after that. Alrighty, that, what was this set? Of course, this kill is awfully similar to one from A Bay of Blood, made by Italian filmmaker Mario Bava a decade earlier. If you're a fan of Friday the 13th, please check out A Bay of Blood, aka Twitch of the Death Nerve. It's a better shot, more interesting, and bloodier Friday the 13th. As for if this kill was ripped off, director Steve Miner says he never saw the Bava film. My guess is it came from money man Phil Scuderi, who came up with a lot of part two sequels sequences and kills while leaving Ron Kirst to handle the dialogue and story. With her pelvis perfumed, Vicky's ready to ravage Mark, but it's not Mark she finds waiting for her in bed. <laughs> it's Baghead Jason, making his first appearance ever. Nobody on set thought the pillowcase mask was great, but they needed to cover up Jason's face and no one could come up with anything better. The sack was suggested by costume designer Ellen Lutter, who was inspired by the villain in the town that dreaded sundown. Lutter also has the distinction of being the only woman to ever play Jason. She was his legs in the opening shot when he was on his way to murder Alice. With only one eye hole, that bag's a bitch for depth of field, which is why things are pretty blurry as Jason stalks towards Vicky with a knife. When he gets to her, he kills her with a knife stab that 
lands off screen. Ouchie! Just like Steve Christie before him, Paul Holt's been having a good time in town while the teenagers he hired get killed. He's at the Lake Waramog Casino in New Preston, Connecticut, hanging out with a bunch of extras played by New Preston locals. Sadly, the building burned down a year or two after part two was filmed. When the conversation inevitably turns to Jason Voorhees, Ginny treats the legend seriously. She figures that if Jason were alive, he'd be a grown man, tormented by the death of the one person in his life who cared. He must have seen his mother get killed, and all just because she loved him. Eventually, Paul and Ginny leave to head back to camp, while Ted makes plans to keep the party going, ensuring Jason's work won't be interrupted. Yep, Ted the Goofball is never seen after this, and thus he survives Friday Part 2, probably the luckiest guy in the series. Ginny and Paul get back to a camp that's suspiciously quiet and clean, since Jason's been taking care of his mess after each kill. Oh, shit, hold up, J-Man, I think you missed a spot. The lights go out, casting the place in darkness, and we get a pretty creepy moment when Ginny realizes they're not alone. Paul, oh, there's someone in this room. Oh, that someone is Baghead Jason, and he wallops the shit out of Paul. For most of these physical stunt-heavy scenes, Jason was played by the late Steve Daskowitz, aka Steve Dash. Once I put the bag over my head, and I ran in the woods, I couldn't see anything, cause the bag flopped back and forth. Dash was quite the character in real life. Chelsea and I still joke about things we heard him say at conventions, but would never repeat in public. Stunt coordinator Cliff Cudney, who cameos as a tow truck driver, brought Steve Dash in to play Jason. Jason after the original actor quit. Warrington Gillette had originally auditioned to be Paul Holt, but was cast as Jason after mentioning he went to, quote, Hollywood Stuntman School. The Hollywood Stuntman School. The Hollywood Stuntman School. I'm guessing that was mostly a bluff, since he reportedly had a hard time with the stunts and quit after just two weeks. The cast seemed to like him, though, maybe because he was also a young, inexperienced actor. Warrington Gillette was my Jason Voorhees. Steve Dash, in contrast, was older and, uh, gruff. He kept away from the younger cast, especially Ginny's actor, Amy Steele. Amy was non-existent. She didn't want to come near me. She didn't want to know anything about me. I respected that. I stayed away from her as well. With Paul out of commission, Ginny starts her final girl circuit. There's a predictable punch through the window scare, a kick-ass steadicam shot that follows her as she's bolting away, and your standard dead body discovery. Ha, <laughs> crazy Ralph. Ginny didn't even know that guy. Ginny climbs out a window and slips in a moment that looks like it really hurt actor Amy Steele. That was a hell of a tough landing on her arm there, man. It seemed like everything was a stunt, and at one point the stunt coordinator said, you know, you should get stunt adjustments for all this. Since Ginny's car is a piece of crap, Jason hangs around outside playing pop-up murderer. Then he pitches a fit and pitches a fork through her car's roof, which is a step too far for her to sit back and take it. Yeah, throw that feral man to the ground, Jin Jin. Ginny hides during the chase so she can kick Jason in the nuts, narrowly avoids him when he leaps out at her from the woods, and uses a freaking chainsaw against him like she were Terry Funk. Aw shit, she's got Jason down. Oh, and now she has a chair? By God, that man has a family. Er, wait, no. His mom got decapitated. His family's dead. Ginny ends up finding Jason's shack, and in another very cool shot, we see Jason running towards her from afar through the window. Hell yes. In a back room, Ginny finds Jason's biggest accomplishment, the Helga Pataki-like shrine to his dead mom with her rotting head and dirty blue sweater. And, you know, some bodies around it. The Mrs. Voorhees shrine is iconic imagery for the series, and was an important part of the Friday the 13th video game. I always have to voice my thanks to that game for Dead Meat's success. It sparked interest in the Friday franchise right as the first kill counts were coming out. Shame the legal battle hurt its development. Using a little bit of that child psychology she's majoring in, Ginny dresses up like Jason's mom and makes herself look like her, hoping that this ruse might allow her to survive this pissed off pickaxer. It's a bold strategy, Cotton Ginny. Let's see if it pays off. Jason, mother is talking to you. It does indeed, with a bit of Betsy Palmer's help. Jason, mother is talking to you. Palmer agreed to reprise the role as long as it wasn't an inconvenience. So some crew members went to her house, set up a black screen, and shot her saying her lines there. God, I love that woman. The ruse works nearly long enough for Ginny to kill Jason, but when he sees his mom's severed head, he snaps back to reality, just in time to fend off her strike with his pickaxe. The first time they filmed the stunt, using a real machete, an exhausted and anxious Amy Steele accidentally sent Steve Dash to the hospital. She missed the pickaxe. 
and she came down on my finger. He went to the ER with a fake machete in his shoulder as a prank, came back a couple of hours later, and finished the scene with his finger in a bandage. That's not the only injury Dash suffered on set. He broke some ribs during a jump when he landed on his pickaxe, and hurt his wrist stabbing a pitchfork into a wooden door that hadn't been properly gimmicked. Jason is slashing at Ginny when Paul shows up out of nowhere to save her. As the boys have a wrestling match, the resourceful Ginny retrieves the machete. She saves Paul by hacking Jason in the neck, which finally puts the mama's boy down. Paul carries Ginny back to a cabin, where a noise at the door lets them know this movie's not quite over, because just on the other side of it is Muffin the Pretty Princess! <gasps> Oh, Muffin, such a good girl. Go to Ginny Muffin. Ginny Muffin. Oh, never mind, Jason Jones scare! Because if it ain't broke, don't fix it, right? With the Swamp Boy Jason chair jumper so successful, screenwriter Ron Curse repeats the beat with an adult Jason, who kind of looks like a rejected member of the Wyatt family. This scare must have been filmed early on in production, since Jason's played by Warrington Gillette swinging in on a pendulum built outside the cabin's window. The prosthetics on his face and the dentures he wore to deform his mouth made it difficult for him to see and breathe. Then, the first time they filmed the stump, the window wasn't built right and he bounced off the wood instead of going through it. By the time they got the shot that wound up in the movie, he was pissed. I was angry and I wanted to kill somebody. And I'm drooling and snot's coming out of your nose. I, I mean, you are just in another world. You're hurting, you're pain. Amy Steele also had a bad time filming the scene and was miserable about having to reshoot it a bunch. I don't know, it really got me, that scene. Steele describes a stressful production overall due to the constant night shoots and always having to act afraid. Other actors said they had a great time, though, and loved camping with the cast and crew to make a movie together. To me, the set sounds like it was genial, but also juvenile, teetering into being outright negative negligent at times. I'm thinking of the underage cast members, the constant injuries, and that actor who got drugged by a sound guy to finish a scene. The movie flashes to white and Ginny wakes up on a stretcher screaming for Paul. Was that last bit just a dream? Is that why Muffin was there after presumably dying earlier? If so, when did the dream start? And did Paul actually die or not? Answer me, Mrs. Voorhees head. ANSWER ME! The movie ends without an answer, or a wink and a smile, despite that being part of the original scripted ending. Good thing they didn't do it. It would have been dumb. When the second verse is same as the first, do we end up with the same level of carnage? Let's find out and get to the numbers. Doomed. You're all doomed. Nine people died in Friday the 13th Part 2, assuming Paul Holt got away. Paul Holt! The victims included five guys and four gals, a very nearly even split, and with a runtime of 87 minutes, that left us with a kill on average every 9.67 minutes. I'll give the golden chainsaw for who was killed to Mark. Love the suddenness of the machete to the face, and the tragedy of him falling backwards down that huge flight of stairs. Also, I think there might be a person in that chair for that stunt? That's so dangerous! The old machete for Lamus kill will go to Terry, who screamed into the camera and disappeared. Even later, when we see her body, there aren't any gruesome effects there. She's just taking a nap next to Mrs. Voorhees' smelly head. And that's it. Friday the 13th Part 2 came out in 1981, and though it wasn't as successful as the first, in part due to increased competition in the slasher subgenre, it did do well enough for Paramount to order a third film. I'll look at that next week, but until then, I'm James A. Janice. This has been the Kill Count. Thanks a lot for watching this week's Kill Count. I want to thank some patrons like Big Bad Cat Dad, Nicolas Verdinez, Dolan Kralla, Wild Smith, and Todd McDonald, aka Carl Brutana Nanaluski. Speaking of Steve Dash, this is a challenge coin that I got from him when I met him at a convention a few years ago. I really like the design of the front, and then the back is his uh, police department that he was part of. That's what he did after being a stuntman, I think. I don't know the status at the time of filming this, but I hope the Fear Street Kill Counts are out and doing good. Thanks, everyone be good people.